I'm Miss Danny from the Pleasant Hills Public Library, and I'm so excited that you're here with us today for another installment of Steam Creatures. So, let's see. Do you remember what all the letters in STEAM stand for? Yeah? Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. And today we will be using all of those subject areas to learn a little bit more about animal adaptations. So you might be asking, what is an adaptation? Well, an adaptation is any quality or behavior or trait that helps an animal survive. So some examples include camouflage, shells and tusks, the ability to change color, those are some pretty neat adaptations. So now let's take a moment to learn a little bit more about some specific adaptations while looking at pictures of animals that use them. An adaptation is a characteristic of a living thing that helps it survive in its environment. All living things have adaptations, even humans. There are three main categories of adaptations, physical, behavioral, and physiological. Physical adaptations include special body parts, such as beaks or tusks, skin and fur, and an animal's ability to camouflage with its surroundings. The cuttlefish, seen here, is a master of camouflage and can change its color to match any surrounding. Mimicry is another physical adaptation. Creatures that use mimicry resemble another living thing, often a more dangerous creature to make themselves less desirable to predators, but you can also see mimicry at work in the satanic leaf-tailed gecko that looks just like dead leaves. Behavioral adaptations are when an animal changes its behavior to survive in its environment. These types of adaptations are mostly learned, not inherited. This includes when birds fly south for the winter to avoid the cold. Water birds use a behavior called preening to spread their natural oils throughout their feathers to stay warm and dry. Meerkats live in large groups so that a few can act as lookouts and watch for predators while the others eat. Lastly, physiological adaptations include metabolic changes in an animal, such as the toxic skin of a poison dart frog or African giant millipede, and a snake's ability to produce venom. By adapting to the unique challenges of their environments, animals are able to thrive and survive. That was a lot of neat animal adaptations, huh, friends? And now let's read a book that'll tell us a little bit more about common adaptations and traits that can be found in animals around the globe. This is Shell, Beak, Tusk, Share Traits and the Wonders of Adaptation, written by Bridget Hills and read today with permission of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt Publishing. Terrific traits. Every living thing on earth has traits that allow it to eat or avoid being eaten. For instance, a sticky tongue allows an anteater to pick up ants, and a shell protects a turtle from a coyote. A sticky shell, on the other hand, would be inconvenient for both respects. Predator would stick to it, and the poor turtle would be forced to lug around dangerous animals while foraging for food. Ugh. Thus, only helpful traits develop over time in a process called evolution. Animals that are related often have similar traits, which they inherited from a common ancestor. Rabbits and hares both have long ears. Whales and dolphins both have fins. This is not surprising. You may have inherited traits from your relatives too. Maybe you have your grandmother's freckles or your uncle's ears. However, some animals share traits but are not related. Why? Well, because they've adapted those same traits separately in order to survive in their environments. And this is called convergent evolution. Think about it. If a sticky tongue helps one animal adapt to eating ants, wouldn't that same trait help an ant-eating animal across the globe? Yeah. Both animals separately would be better equipped to survive and then pass the trait on to their babies. And so the same traits, such as shells, beaks, and tusks, evolve over and over again in different animals. So here we have pictured a walrus and his tusks. Spines are for pricking. A porcupine's spines grow to a foot long. When the porcupine is scared, the spines stand straight out. 
If a coyote, a lion, or owl make the mistake of trying to eat the porcupine, they get pricked. Not only that, but some spines break off and stay stuck in the attacker. The enchenta is covered in spikes too. If it feels threatened, it curls up into a spiny ball, and this tells its predators, mainly dingoes and dogs, not to mess with it. Though they share a spiky defense system, the porcupine and the echenda live on opposite sides of the world and are not related. A porcupine, which lives everywhere but Australia and Antarctica, is part of the rodent family. Native to Australia, an echenda is a rare kind of mammal that lays eggs and is called a monotreme. Fascinating. A shell is for hiding. A turtle shell is made of bone. Most of the turtle's bones are inside its body, but its backbone and rib cage grow as the shell. If a box turtle sees a fox or a raccoon, it hides its head, tail, and legs inside the bony shell. Unable to break through, the predator eventually gives up, and the turtle wins the game of hide and seek. The only bony part of a snail is its shell. The rest of its body, the soft part, is called the foot. If a snail is threatened, it pulls its foot, which includes its head, belly, and everything else, inside the shell. Beetles, spiders, and even some larger animals like birds can't crack the shell, so the snail is safe. The box turtle is a reptile related to lizards and snakes. A snail is part of the mollusk family, along with clams, oysters, and octopuses. Turtles and snails are not even distant cousins. Tall ears are for hearing and more. A rabbit's tall ears can rotate 270 degrees or three quarters of the way around. It's pretty cool. This allows the rabbit to hear foxes, dogs, and hawks approach from any direction. The ears also cool the rabbit off in the summer and warm it up in the winter. During cold weather, blood vessels in the ears shrink so that less warm blood flows to the ears and escapes through the skin and this keeps the heat inside the rabbit. Ability has tall ears for the same reason, to hear predators, which includes pythons, dingoes, and feral cats. In the hot Australian desert, the bilby may also use its ears to shed heat. In hot weather, blood vessels in the ears swell so that more warm blood travels there. For an animal with big ears, this allows plenty of warmth to escape through the skin. Rabbits, which live all over the world, are rodents. Billabies live only in Australia, and they are marsupials like kangaroos. In addition to big ears, rabbits and billabies both have strong hind legs for hopping away from predators. Wings are for flying. A bird's wings are covered with stiff feathers. The feathers push down the air and the air pushes back up. This allows the bird to fly. Flying makes birds better at catching prey, finding fruits and nuts, and escaping predators. Bat wings are made not of feathers, but of cartilage. Your ears are also made of cartilage. It stretches from the bat's long fingers to its feet. Flying allows bats to hunt insects in mid-flight and to feast on many different plants in one night. Birds and bats developed wings separately. Birds evolved from fast and ferocious dinosaurs called theropods, which include Tyrannosaurus and raptors. Bats, which are mammals, likely evolved from a mammal that glided from tree to tree, just as lemurs and flying squirrels do today. Black and white is for camouflage. Penguins may appear to be wearing tuxedos, but their color pattern is actually camouflage. A shark or a seal swimming over a penguin will fail to see its black back, which blends in with the dark ocean depths. It's hard for them to see a penguin from underneath, too. Its white belly gets masked by the sunlight streaming in from above. So if sharks and seals can't see a penguin, they can't eat it. Orcas, or killer whales, are also black and white. But as the top predator in the ocean, an orca doesn't use its camouflage for protection. Rather, the orca's black and white pattern allows it to sneak up on the animals it eats, such as seals, whales, and even penguins, if the orca can see them. Though they share the ocean, a penguin is a bird and an orca is a mammal. They both develop black and white coloring as an adaptation to life in the ocean. A light is for drawing attention. 
A firefly's glow is caused by a chemical inside its body. The flashing light is usually used to attract a mate. But fireflies don't always play fair. Some trick other species. In that case, a firefly will see a familiar flash and approach, only to get eaten by the trickster insect. In the darkness of the deep sea, the anglerfish's light dangles from its dorsal fin. It glows because of a light-up bacteria living inside the fish. The light lures other fish to come near, and then the anglerfish eats them. A firefly is a beetle, or a type of insect. An anglerfish is, of course, a fish. In both cases, the lights say, look at me! What they don't say is, I'm going to eat you. A beak is for crushing. A parrot's beak is thick and sharp. For instance, a macaw weighs just two pounds, but the force of its bite is 167 pounds per inch. That's five times stronger than the bite of a deadly python. But the parrot doesn't eat other animals. It uses its beak to crush nuts and seeds. While an octopus beak is just like a parrot's, the octopus crushes not nuts, but crabs and mollusks with its beak. It is the only hard part in its body. An octopus is a cellophoid that lives in all the world's oceans. A parrot is a bird that is native to Central and South America, Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and Australia. But they both have a beak to help them eat hard things. A bill is for slurping. A duck bill is round and flat. Along the edge, there's a comb. The duck scoops up animals such as insects, snails, and fish from the pond, and then it spits out mud and muck through the comb. A duck's bill is soft around the edges so that it can feel its food. The duck-billed platypus uses its bill in the same way as a duck. The two animals also share webbed feet for paddling through the water. A platypus mother even lays eggs like a mother duck. A duck is a bird, and a platypus is a mammal, a monotreme like the enchenda. A platypus has fur, and once hatched, a platypus drinks milk from their mother. Fur and milk make a platypus a mammal, and not a duck. A long, sticky tongue is for catching insects. A giant anteater's tongue is two feet long and super sticky. After clawing open an anthill and stucking its long snout inside, it begins flicking its tongue so that the ants stick to it. In this way, it can eat 35,000 ants and termites each day. That's insane. Using its long sticky tongue for the same purpose, to eat insects, is the aardvark. Its favorite food is termites, but it's been known to lick up its share of ants, too. Anteaters and aardvarks are both mammals, but anteaters live in South America and aardvarks live in Africa. The closest relative of the anteater is the sloth, whereas the aardvark is close cousins with the elephant. A tusk is for mm, lots of things. Walrus tusks are teeth that grow up to three feet long. Male walruses fight using their tusks, but the tusks are helpful in other ways too. When a walrus is swimming in the Arctic Sea and needs to take a breath, it can break through the ice with its tusks. A swimming walrus can also pull itself onto the ice with its tusks. Elephant tusks are teeth too, but can grow to 10 feet long. Like walruses, male elephants fight with their tusks, but elephants also use their tusks to dig for food and tear bark from trees, which they then eat. Walruses and elephants are both mammals, but they are not close kin. A walrus's nearest relatives are sea lions and seals. Surprisingly, an elephant's closest cousin is also a sea creature, the manatee. Tusks are helpful tools for both walruses and elephants. Twin traits. Helpful traits repeat themselves again and again in nature. In fact, when scientists discover new species, they often name them after animals that they resemble. For instance, the mole cricket got its name because its forelegs look like a mole, which it uses to dig underground, just like its namesake. There are also animals known as the giraffe weevil, pictured here, an insect with a long neck like a giraffe. 
a porcupine fish with spines like a porcupine that stick out when it's threatened, and a parrotfish, which has a beak-like mouth similar to a parrot. All of these animals developed twin traits because they needed them to survive similar situations, but often in different environments. There are still animals that have yet to be discovered, and because of convergent evolution, they'll likely have features that we've seen elsewhere. It's fun to imagine what these animals might be. A duck-billed lizard? An elephant fish with tusks? Odd as they may seem, they will also look vaguely familiar. And now it's time for Isn't our STEAM fast. challenge! So all of the supplies that you'll need to complete these challenges, because there's two this week, are in a take-home kit that is available in our lobby while supplies last. In case you can't get the kit for whatever reason, most of our supplies are things you probably have at home or can find something similar to use. In our kit is some cooking oil, two napkins, a paintbrush, an oral syringe, a medicine dropper, or feather or a shapes cut from paper. Would also work. A word and a search slash featuring two animals that use camouflage, a butterfly, and a lizard. To complete the challenge, some we'll extra paper towels or napkins, a shallow dish of water, scissors, a pencil or a pen, and something to color with, whether that's crayons, tape, markers, or colored pencils. So let's head over to our craft table to learn just how we're going to do these challenges. Our first experiment is going to help us learn how birds that are in water, such as penguins and ducks, stay warm and dry. So we're going to need our paper feathers, our napkins, extra paper towels, the water, the oil, the paintbrush, and the oral syringe. We're going to start by unfolding our napkins and putting them on top of your paper towels because we're going to be dealing with water and oil and we don't want it to get everywhere. Lay one feather on top of each napkin and pick one to be your control, meaning you're not going to do anything to it. You're going to leave it just how it is. And the other one, we're going to paint with oil. So get out your oil and your paintbrush and Once cover you have that one entire feather covered in oil with oil. one not touched at all. It's time to get out your oral syringe. Now, we provided these because they were cheaper in bulk than medicine droppers, but anything that can drip water will work. So you're going to put it in the water. Pull it up slowly to fill it. And let's do our control feather first. So very slowly push down so that the water drips all over that feather. Whoa. Now we're going to do the same thing with the oil. Let's get a closer look so you can see the difference. So as you can see, our control feather has absorbed the water. You can test this by lifting it up. No water drips off. It's soaked through. What about our oil feather? Just by observing, you can see that a lot of the water has pulled on top. So let's see what happens when we pick it up and tilt it. The water rushes right off. So ducks and other water birds, That's pretty cool. swans and geese and penguins use a process called preening to release their natural body oils into their outer feathers. And that's why we covered one feather in oil. That helps the water roll right off so that the inner feathers stay dry and the animal stays warm. Isn't that cool? For our second experiment, you'll need your camouflaged animal sheets. Find a location where you want your animal to hide and then color your animal, you can do two different locations or the same, it's up to you, to match their surroundings. And once you're done coloring, cut it out and tape it up to the wall. Make sure to use wall safe tape, such as masking tape or painter's tape. 
and then see if someone else in your family or a friend can find the animal. I'm going to hide these animals, and I want you to see if you can find them. Well, thanks for joining us today, friends, and I hope you enjoyed these STEAM challenges. Join us next week when we explore the rain. Until then, stay safe.